eighth note chugging. Oh, I'm gonna turn you up in my water. I'm not hearing much in a way like. Where did Amy go? Where did Amy go? You got Amy?
Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me.
no more beautiful reality than God with us. You have made your home with man. We are now yours because of your Holy Spirit who now indwells us. And you said it was better that you would have your home with us. So Lord, we are yours. Have your way this morning, Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, through the revelation of your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes, open our ears to hear you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for sticking around. Those of you guys that were here for Sunday Connect, um, we have a gift. If you haven't heard from Jared yet this morning, then you're in for a gift. Our friend Jared Roth Wilson, he was here with us in September. He's back and uh, going to be teaching with us. Come on up here, Jerry. He's going to be teaching um, in our Among series in Acts chapter 21 today and next weekend too. So don't miss the opportunity to be here next weekend. Uh, I also want to invite you to something you'll be hearing out uh, through our different channels. But this, this coming Wednesday night, they are so excited to get to know us even more. So that's going to be a night where uh, they get to ask us questions and, and see all of our wrinkles and warts and <laughs> curious messiness. Uh, and may we uh, do that. So fill this room as we get to hang out with them and their questions uh, this morning. Jared, thanks for coming back. Thanks yeah, for being here. My pleasure. You guys, it's been a... Yeah, do that. It's been a journey together. We've not been uh, quiet together with Jared and Jess in the weeks that they've been gone from the teaching here, but we've been in conversation remotely for some time. And... Uh, we still don't have a decision yet, um, and they don't have a decision yet, uh, but we are convinced of this. How does Open Door Fellowship and Endeavor Communities continue to share the gospel of grace right where we're at and what's ahead related to the teaching in both places? Yeah. So uh, this morning, join me as we pray for the, the morning. Father God, thank you for uh, this man and his family and the leading of your spirit in them and their ministry of past and their trusting you in the journey ahead. God, it feels like a fork in the road. And the answer is yes to one of them and yes to both of them, God. So uh, in these weeks ahead, as we together the fellowship, we pray uh, for decisioning. This morning, we pray for simple peace. Yeah. God, you have impassioned this man to share your word and your gospel and his story and his journey that's at present. So, Father God, strengthen him, set him free with joy and peace, and may he just be present in your word. Jesus, speak to us. Open our hearts and our minds, and may we be moved. May we hear you, God, speaking through your word. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Good morning, friends of God. How are you? Good. Um, my name is Jared, and I want to introduce to you, if you haven't met her yet, my wife Jessica, who's sitting here, and next to her is Madison and Peyton and uh, our kids, and we also have another one, Eden, who's in children's ministry right now, and, uh, and like we do before, we, we came here before, and we, f we thought that you guys were safe, so we went ahead and ran a full criminal background and credit history check on you guys. Just to make sure you're safe, and now that we know that everything is... I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> And now that we know that you guys are all A-OK, -okay, except for actually John Lynch, who had sort of a colorful incident on there, uh, it regarded some cow-tipping kilts and uh, graffitiing the word grace across the Wittenberg Castle church door. When the word, when the word grace is, uh, is, is spelled out, though, is written, you notice the rolling R kind of loses all of its character. It, it, it ends up looking like somebody is extremely angry or something, or maybe a country western singer wrote it, or I don't know. Uh, Martin Luther had 95 theses, and uh, John Lynch uh, has one, and it reads, It's grace! Um, I love the guy. I can make fun of him. He's not here right now, so just don't tell him about this, okay? Uh, I have been given... Uh, first of all, I'm just giddy to be back with you guys. I'm thrilled to be with you. Really, when we came here and we started spending time with y'all, we were just like, It is so good to be here. Um, you guys have caused us to love you, 
And, and I just appreciate all of the gestures of love and affection you guys have given us. We've just, we, we just love you all. So I've been given truly the pearl of the book of Acts, Acts 21, uh, to preach for the next two weeks. That is if I don't mess this one up too bad, right? Uh, may not be invited back next week. Um, so we're going to be in Acts 21. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open it up right now uh, to Acts 21. And let's go ahead and pray. God, you are the same God who spoke at creation, the same one whose words uh, created out of nothing. You're the God who, who speaks and recreates. You're the God whose words never come back to you empty or void. You're the God who, when you speak, miraculous things happen. And so what are you going to do now as we open up these scriptures? Our hearts and our minds um, wonder at you, O Lord at how you can continue to be living and active through this written word. Every time that we open it, we get something, something new from you, or at least a new touch from you. We just want to ask you that as we open the scripture, that you would help our, our eyes to be open and our hearts to be prepared for great and powerful things. Oh Lord, you're the God who, who gave us these words, and we trust you that when you're going to speak to us, life-altering things happen, and life-giving things happen. We thank you for these words in Acts 21. We give you ourselves in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a friend who was in the military, and he served a couple of really hard tours of duty uh, in the Middle East. And when he finally finished that up, he came back home, and he was just so, um, so rattled by the things that he had seen and that he had been a part of, that when he got home, he just decided that with his life, he wanted to do something good with it. He says, I just want to help people. I just want to do something good with my life. And so he started making plans by himself. And he had heard a rumor somewhere that in Cambodia, if you just knew how to speak English well, that you would be able to be given a job uh, teaching kids English. And so uh, on that rumor alone, he packed a bag and pocketed his cell phone and pecked his mother on the cheek and boarded a plane to Cambodia and uh, decided to go teach kids English there. Well, when he got there, he found out that there were no jobs uh, to be had teaching English. In fact, there were no jobs of any kind to be had for him. Uh, and so he kept seeking employment because he just wanted to do something good. And he thought, okay, well, this may be a salvageable. He, he kept seeking employment and finally found employment in a total dive of a bar that gave him just a filthy corner to sleep in and as much alcohol as he wanted. Some of the less reputable clients of the bar uh, exchanged drugs for the alcohol that he could give them. And, uh, and so he just, his life spiraled downhill fast. And just when he thought he had hit rock bottom, um, he walked to the river, which is full of all manner of vile sludge, to, to bathe himself and into a cut on his foot, tenanted a parasite, which ravaged his foot and swole it to the size of a football and started traveling up his leg. And so finally, in fear of his life, he called his mom and said, will you please get me home, which she did. She flew him home immediately, and uh, when he got there and he got off the plane, she saw in front of her an emaciated, penniless, dirty, and dying junkie. To this day, even though he has no relationship with God to speak of, he still blames God that it all went so disastrously when all he wanted to do was a good thing. I think that every person on earth has a sense of destiny, has a desire to do great things with their life. But only those in a relationship with God have the potential to fully realize that purposeful life by trusting God, being set free from the power of sin and death, and by maturing into God's dreams for us. Do you agree this morning? So if you're here this morning, maybe for the first time, or you're exploring Christianity, or you're exploring the faith, and you're considering I wonder if this Jesus thing has any bearing on my life. And you don't know yet, but you do have great and incredible dreams, and you have a sense of destiny in your life, but you don't have a relationship with God. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. This is the day that God invites you through Jesus Christ to be in a relationship with him so that you can be unlocked in your potential to live into that purposeful life and to be close and intimate with the God who created everything. And that's what he's extending an invitation to you for today. If you are not in a relationship with God, we're going to be talking about the will of the Lord this morning. And that's sort of a, sort of a, a vague kind of statement, isn't it? Um, 
if you're not familiar with the will of God, what it simply means is, is the desire of God or what God wants. And uh, even if you're not facing down a huge decision in your life, like the Apostle Paul is in our text this morning, you're going to see that what God wants is, is a purposeful and a powerful life, although it isn't always easy. Um, but it's something that we all deeply, deeply desire. So because of that, we don't really have time to talk about everything regarding the will of God, but we do have time to talk about the things that are represented in the text here this morning in Acts 21. Uh, I would love to have more conversation with you about it, because to be real with you, my family is going through <laughs> uh, a huge ordeal trying to discover the will of God. Yeah? Um, it would be so... I was actually going to save all the personal stuff for the end of the sermon. See this, see this paragraph down here? That's the personal bit. That's the part where I'm actually emotional with you. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just going to let this kind of gush a little bit. Is that okay? This is going to be, this is going to be so messy. This is going to be a hot mess. Um, uh, I'm, I'm normally, I like to keep things very linear and cogent, and I, and I, like, to, I like to keep things on, 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 uh, on paper. But this morning, I just need to unload a little bit and tell you guys that as we've explored this possibility, and that's all it is, of, of maybe becoming you guys' teaching pastor and leaving truly our, I mean, our church family and our family. These people have come around us and they've loved us and we love them so deeply. Um, as we've explored that, this has been really hard. This whole process has just really rocked us to the core, honestly. Um, and so I, I just come to you, um, a normal guy, this morning. Um, and I want to share with you how hard this is. I mean, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, we started this church in our living room six, seven years ago, the seven of us, and, and it's grown, and the people who have come have become, have become family to us. And some of them are our family. All of us live in the Northwest. All of us live in the Portland Metro. And, um, and, and, and what am I doing here? <laughs> uh, we've, been asking, we've been asking for a sign. We've been asking for a closed door. I know today, you know, the Cardinals are playing the Seahawks. Maybe we thought, like, whatever team wins, that's, you know, if, if the Seahawks win, we belong in the Northwest. I don't know. You know, let's just leave it, let's just leave it in the Lord's hands, right? I don't know if that's what that is, but um, so we're struggling. I, I just I just wanted to show you where our hearts are at, um, and let you know I'm not I'm not preaching this to you like for something for you to do. I'm I'm journeying through a really difficult time in our life, and and I hope that we can um, we can love each other through our transitions and through our discoveries together. Uh, so that's where we're coming from here as we jump into Acts 21 verse one. Um, let's go ahead and start into our text this morning. It says, After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Cos. What is the Cos? Bill Cosby, of course, but uh, it's probably too soon for that joke. So, <laughs> Cos <Cause> is... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, be spiritual. Um, Cos is a city on the Apostle Paul's way back to Jerusalem. Why is he going back to Jerusalem? Well, rewind a little bit. Acts 20, verse 24. Paul is in service to Jesus Christ doing a great task. This lesser journey of him going to Jerusalem is really not his great task. It's just a lesser journey that's in service to a great, great task that Jesus called him to do, which is to testify to the gospel of God's grace. A huge purpose, right? Now, I can sometimes get really focused in on, the, on this little journey that we're going through. I don't know if you can do the same, but you know, whatever the next vista is, whatever the next horizon is, whatever the next challenge is, I can get so focused on that that I can lose track of the fact that it's all in service to a much greater task. And so this, this lesser journey, I've been pensive, I've been worried, I've been scared, I've been confused, I've been so focused on this at times that I'm just, I, I, I'm weak, to be honest with you, as I come up in front of you this morning. I'm just weak. And so um, what Paul shows us here is that he, he's going to Jerusalem, but it's not, it's not the only thing that he's doing. This is all underneath the umbrella of a huge and magnificent task, which is to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Last time I was here, some people kind of asked this question when I was here. I, I, I said at the end, uh, may we dream greater dreams. And, uh, and some people were like, what do you mean by that? I really feel like a lot of Christians don't dream big enough. First of all, our God is spectacularly huge, right? Right? 
And so because of that, what great things may he do through our lives? Oftentimes I think we limit him because we think either A, like he's busy doing something great somewhere else, or like why would he pay attention to me to do great things through me, right? And so we belittle ourselves in thinking that God could actually care enough about me that he would do something fantastic for his kingdom's sake through an individual like ourselves, but he has always used weak, weak people, and he's always used hurting and empty people. As we sat down and did devotions with our kids and started asking the question, who are some people in the Bible who went through transitions in the scriptures? We were staggered and just came away saying like, oh yeah, everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah, so all of, okay, so where do we, where do we start with that? Um, I know a woman, speaking of dreaming too small, I know a woman who, um, who wrote up a long and comprehensive list of what she wanted to see in, in her future husband. Have you known anybody like this? I mean, it was a tome, just writing like, he's going to be like this, he's going to look like this, he's going to act like this, he's going to smell like this. And so all, this huge list, right? And I just love it when people give God lists. That's always fun. She, um, she found a guy in our church that fit the description, uh, and she nursed the secret infatuation with him. Now, she never talked to the guy, but that's beside the point. She knew they were going to get married. It was like, right, God had revealed it to her, but then one day, in, across from a crowded room, it happened. He smiled at her, and oh, sparks flew, emotions ran high. That was it, man. Time to say yes to the dress. She was sold. This God had given her a sign, right? And so she started, um, she, she started just uh, planning out their future. Well, seasons passed, and nothing came of it. She still did not talk to him, and he I didn't talk to her, didn't know anything of it. And eventually she, she came to the point where she says, I got to do something about this. She wrote out this 10-page paper describing their future together and gave it to our friend um, who had to look her up on Facebook to find out who she was. Uh, here's, here's the problem. When we start focusing on really small things like that, like, I wonder if he likes me or... You know, I got to get myself in that awesome car. How do I get me a raise? You know, all those lesser kind of journeys. When we start focusing on that as if that is the will of God for us, that is just too small and it's not satisfying. Amen? Any of you guys like salad for dinner? Because I don't. I feel like I'm, I'm going to be real with you guys. Like I said, we got to be real, right? I don't like salad for dinner. It's too small. It's not satisfying enough. That's me, man. Okay? So I, and I feel like a lot of believers have too small of dreams. They're salad sized dreams. I should stop knocking on. If any of you guys are vegetarians, I affirm it, whatever. <laughs> Nonpartisan on that issue, okay? Um, but, uh, but yeah, to be satisfied, I think that our, um, God's will for us is big. It's big. It's something for us to be a part of. God's will for us is, is big enough that it may be articulated the same way that Paul said it, which is to, to testify to the goodness of God's grace. It's something big, right? And I always thought, like, you know, we're going to start this church in Portland, and that's going to be it. Born in Portland, live in Portland, die in Portland, that's it. You know, Rose City. Um, and so uh, I thought that was it. I thought that was our, our great task. Maybe it's a lesser journey. I'm not sure. Someone may say, you know, well, I'm just a stay-at-home parent, or I'm, I'm a repairman, or I'm laid up right now, or I'm unemployed. You know, how can I, how can I testify to the goodness of God's grace in, in my position because I don't really have an opportunity to do something magnificent, something huge, and, and we need to remember God knows exactly where we're at, right? He knows just where you are, and he has you there because he wants you to give a portrait of his goodness to you in that place and in that time. Now, if there is a pair of ears to hear how God has been good to you, you can fulfill that great task that God gave the Apostle Paul. So I don't know how you would articulate it. What is your great task? But I think it probably has something to do with testifying the goodness of God's grace. Amen? So um, I started in this journey of trying to discover God's will, trying to understand, do we make the choice, all that kind of stuff. I've started to, to question, is God's will something that we're supposed to find and do? Or is it something that we are? Because I believe that you and I are the will of God in Christ Jesus. And that we are, you are, a magnificent portrait of God's grace to be shown to the powers of the universe to say, look how much I love this person. And, and that's what God wants to do in us and with us. And he can move us where he wants or how he wants or to do what he wants. It's not about what or where, it's it's, it's about who, right? 
And so we are the will of God in Christ Jesus. And so we need to stop worrying so much. I need to stop worrying so much about when and where and how. And remember who is behind this whole journey. Um, And it's him. It's a God who's faithful. It's a God who loves. It's a God who is full of generosity and grace. And he walks with us. And he wants to to show himself through us, no matter where we're at. Um, uh, Here's here's a problem, though. We've only gotten through half of a verse. I think we need to... Let's scoot forward here and finish up that verse at least before we dismiss, right? Um, The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patara. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyr, where our ship was to unload its cargo. Finding the disciples there, this is interesting, Uh, we stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. What's up with that? But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt and prayed together. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. Now, in chapter 20, different, ver- different versions will read different ways. It'll say, Paul will say, I'm bound to the idea of going to Jerusalem. Some will say, I'm compelled to go to Jerusalem. Some will say, I am bound by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to go. Here you have the Holy Spirit through believers warning Paul not to go. In a little bit, we're going to see Agabus the prophet saying, you shouldn't go if you don't want to get hurt. And so what is the Holy Spirit doing here? Is, is God making the choice and saying, Paul, you need to go? Or is Paul getting to make the choice and God either gets to endorse it or veto it? Does that make sense to you? Because that changes everything about our approach. And that's been something that we've been struggling with as we've been trying to figure out how do we discover or do we decide the will of God in our lives? And it's so complicated. <laughs> um, I, I've been wondering if maybe it's all of the above. I've been wondering, you know, does God get to choose? Or do we get to choose? Or do we as a family get to choose? Or does the community get to choose? And, or is it just that God has chosen and we need to discover what God's will is and we have no choice? Or are we supposed to use our minds or our hearts in this decision-making process? I think the answer is yes. Um... When I was done at seminary, I had a much more ironclad idea about how God affects his will in our lives. Maybe you've heard the one about the theologians who are arguing with each other about how to discover you know, God's will. Is it God who chooses things or is it people who chooses things? You know, Predestination or free will. And so they were arguing so vehemently one day that they completely split into two different groups. One says God gets to choose, the other says people choose, and this one poor fellow couldn't figure out which group to go into, and so he goes over to the the predestination group, the group that says that God chooses. And, uh, and they ask him, how did you end up here? And he says, well, I just thought it was the best group, so I decided and I came on over. And they're like, get out of here, man. We d- you, you, have to, you, know, you have to be called of God to be a part of this group. And so he stumbled over to the other group and, and they asked, how did you come to be here? And he said, well, honestly, I was sent over here. And they're like, you hit the bricks, bucko, man. We, d- we think that you have to come of your own free will. And uh, <laughs> It's like, you know, it's a lose-lose scenario, it feels like. And, and that's how, that's the fear and that's the consternation and that's the difficulty, that's the tension that we've been living in is like, you know, that, who gets to choose, you know? And so I think that it may be all of the above as, as we've lived through this. I think that God affects his will in our lives in all kinds of different ways. It turns out, I think that he compels, he coaxes, he cajoles, he invites, he insinuates, he's, he wheedles and woos. He does all of these things to dance with us. Because I used to look at the will of God as just like this tightrope that I had to walk. And if I were to make a wrong step, it would be plunging into an eternal abyss of God's displeasure. You know what I mean? Like God's will for our lives is just this little dot. And if we somehow miss it by a fraction, then all of a sudden I'm a second-rate Christian and God is going to look down on me for the rest of my life. If any of you, any of you brought up like that, that's how I was brought up. <laughs> no need to say amen. That's a bad thing to say. Okay. Uh, so... So that's how I was brought up, and I used to think it was a tightrope, you know? And anymore, I think, yeah, we still need to stay on our toes, but it's not because we're on a tightrope, it's because we're dancing. Um, 
I'm not making this decision by myself. I'm not up here doing this river dance, you know, by myself. I'm dancing with God. And he does all of the, he has all of these, the strength of his movement or the, or just the insinuation of his movement is so complex that I think that he wants us to just come close to him and move with him in this process, yeah? More than that, I think that it's not just a dance between me and God. I think that it's a dance between me, God, and my community. And so we're all doing some kind of, what is that dance? What's the country? You guys are from country, you're from the Southwest. What do you do? What's this, what is the country? Yeah, I don't know, anyway. Square dancing, getting a circle, I don't know. It's also geometrical. Country dancing is all very geometrical. Um, so some kind of dance like that with all of our community is involved too, right? And, and if, if we do make a misstep, we don't need to worry about, okay, I stepped on, stepped on his toes, I'm sorry, Lord, but he's full of generosity and grace. And he smiles at us and maybe laughs too and says, okay, that's how we learn. That's how we move together, right? And, and then these others who are in the circle with me, because we've talked to everybody and we've shared with them and asked them to be part of this journey with us at our church, just like you are, to say we're all exploring together. So God does not see these two independent churches. He certainly doesn't see two or six or 20 candidates he looks at, and he's not even looking at two different churches, he's looking at one church, his bride, who he loves more than we could ever imagine. And he's saying, how can we move together? So you are not alone, my friends, we're doing this together. Um, that's the dance that he invites us into. Let's move on to verse 7 here. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemaeus where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. That is, he was one of the seven deacons that was selected in Jerusalem back in Acts chapter 6. We, uh, he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus, here he is, came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Same word, bind, when Paul said, I'm bound to go to Jerusalem. And he says, Oh, you're bound to go to Jerusalem. You will be bound in Jerusalem. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Here he is again, the Holy Spirit, moving in some complex ways. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm not only ready to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he wouldn't be dissuaded, we gave up and said, Okay, the Lord's will be done. Whatever he wants. And there is this real relational tension that happens when we trust God in others. That tension is intentional. On the one end of the tug of war is Paul. He said that his friend's weeping is breaking his heart, so let's not miss the fact that he was emotionally engaged. He was vulnerable with his friends. He was in conversation with his community about his decisions. He was not making his choices unilaterally for himself. He asked other people into it, and their opinions mattered to him. While, at the same, while he, hid, he did have to make the choice himself in the end on where his feet would land, his people's opinions mattered. He was vulnerable. He didn't put up any walls. He didn't, he didn't try and protect himself out of pride or self-preservation. Paul was weak among them. And because of that, his vulnerability invited protection. Protection from friends who tried to, to protect him from what they thought would be a disastrous choice, but when he wouldn't be dissuaded, they decided, we'll not only protect our friend, we're going to protect our friendship, even when we think that he's wrong. And so here's Paul on the one end of the tug of war, being vulnerable, being open with people, inviting people in, and being affected by it. And, and I'm sometimes uh, I want to protect myself against that, that from people, don't you? When, when it's going to hurt. Sometimes I'd rather just kind of make the choice myself than go through all of that and just kind of tell people a conclusion instead of tell them, invite them in earlier in the journey. Um, guys, it's been so hard. We've had hundreds of faces that just kind of melt when we talk to them, just over the possibility, over the potential of us not having a future together except in eternity. Um, and it's broken our hearts, just even the possibility. But we needed to invite them in on this process because we need our community. We need to not do this unilaterally. We need to honor people by trusting 
the Holy Spirit in them to be able to speak to us, right? They're part of this dance. On the other end of the tug of war is Paul's friends. They tried to protect their friend from what they saw in the Spirit was a disastrous choice. I don't know if you've ever been there with friends of your own or kids or grandkids, right? Who you think, like, has anybody been there where your friends are going to make a choice where it's like, oh my goodness, if you do that, it's not going to go well for you, right? Anybody? And when you're in that position, it is so hard to do what Paul's friends did, which was not just try and protect their friend, but protect their friendship and say, in the end, okay, the Lord's will be done. I'm still for you. Because that's what God does with us when we make a bad decision, right? And we get to reflect God's nature in being an advocate. God does that for us. He says, okay, that's quite a mess you made back there. And uh, I wish it wasn't all over the internet right now, but uh, I'm, I'm still for you. I'm still for you. I'm still for you. And so getting to reflect God's nature as an advocate is something that the community gets to benefit from if we involve them in decision-making, yeah? And, and, and we as individuals need to benefit from the community, from their corporate wisdom, and also from the love that they get to extend to us. Because as we've talked to people, it's not always been like a blanket endorsement of like, oh, whatever you want's cool. It's been, you know, diverse answers and feelings and all those things. But what we have gotten out of this is such a sense of, um, of appreciation and affirmation and love and wisdom that we could have never had outside of it. So I commend this to you, my friends, to, to bring people in on our decision-making, right? Um, the tension is intentional. It's something that we get to grow in as individuals, and it's something that our community gets to benefit from when we get to discover what is it like to hear the voice of God as a family, not as an individual. So I want to thank you guys uh, for giving me this passage because I think I've benefited more from it than you have from this rambling monologue. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank you. This has been so good for our family because we, um, we've been facing the same kind of tense, complicated, sometimes messy, okay, often it's pretty messy, love that's here in Acts 21. Um, I appreciate you letting me just be real with you and just show my heart to you. Um, this is so hard for us. I'm scared. I'm confused. Um, we're also excited and energized by this journey. But, I mean, I'm struggling not to feel like Judas Iscariot because <laughs> some of these people may feel feelings of betrayal, even in, just, even in just the thought. Say, like, how could you possibly entertain the idea of leaving your family? We're big brother and big sister to people in Portland who now don't know the future of our relationship from it. We don't take it lightly. We're, we're seeking advice from theologians and movement leaders and faithful men and women of God that we trust and love. And, um, and it has been a journey for all of us. Um, I've had to struggle with how much fear and anxiety is just part of being human and how much of it is not an attitude of faith because in me, I felt like it, I, I tipped over the edge there for a while. And one of my greatest mentors said, actually, brother, I think you may need to repent of this. And I have had to repent of feelings of fear and anxiety, not that some of that isn't a healthy thing, but, but I got unhealthy for a while. I got unhealthy for a while. And we've been praying for God just to, just to give us a sign, you know, like, hey, Star of Bethlehem would be great. Give us any sign at all. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take that, though. Or a, a door to be closed or something. But y'all's name is Open Door for Pete's sake, okay? <laughs> so I don't know how God's going to speak to us, but I do think that, like, I do think we'd take it as a definite no from God if you guys changed your church name to Closed Door Fellowship. <laughs> so that's one way to get rid of us. Um, <laughs> um, but we do want to leave it in the Lord's hands and we want to dance with him. I think that Paul would tell you that, that there's an intentional tension in doing relationships as we all discover the will of God together. You guys have felt it, even in, even in this process that, that I'm referring to. You, you've all felt that. And I thank you for dancing with the Lord and with your leaders. Whatever decision God makes, we'll be overjoyed with, truly. Um, and so we pray that God's will would be done in this. I don't ever want to say, your will be done as if it's the worst thing possible that could happen to us. You know, with a sigh, like, oh, man. Because God's will is not the worst thing that could happen to us. It's, it's the best thing possible, right? Is it easy? No. And Paul would tell you, like, no, it's not easy. It's so hard. It's so hard. Sometimes. 
But the rewards are magnificent because dancing with the Lord, we feel those moments of intimacy with him unlike anything that we've ever felt before. And I hope that you will also do the same. I don't know if you're facing down a big decision in your life, but somebody is who you know. Join the dance with them. Or remember these things for the next time you do go through a big decision. Um, I think that like Paul and like Jesus, we want to ask the question, not, are we, not where are we most needed or where are we most useful? We want to ask the question, where is the will of the Father in this? And that may lead us to a very different place entirely. Um, living as the will of God, the already affirmed, entirely endorsed, living will of God on earth is the freest and the most natural and the most electrifying life possible. And I want to invite you into that same joy and that same purpose that was Paul's and that was Jesus. Uh, Oswald Chambers, I think, sums it up well. He says, the characteristic of our Lord's life was submission to his Father. Not the crushing down of his own will to his Father's, but the love agreement of his will with his Father's. Jesus says, I am here for one thing only, to do thy will, and I delight to do it. Let's pray. So God, we just ask that um, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We uh, are so thrilled to be invited into an intimate relationship um, with you where we get to experience you in a way that maybe we've not before. We ask you for each person in this room, Lord, um, as they walk with you and as they move with you, that they would draw um, closer to you. Thank you for being as close as possible to us by the Holy Spirit's indwelling. But God, we pray that we would that we would have a special sense of that intimacy as we dance with you today. We ask you for all this, Lord, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. of our faith, we look not to the devices of man, we look not to our own schemes, God, but we look to you, and you alone. You are the keeper of our hearts, the protector of our lives, the giver of life, our peace, our joy, our brand new identity, Jesus is you.
Gee, come lace this tail, buddy. Is it okay to do it over here? Oh man, I think we're outside of the God's will right now. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Jason's advice to me, just don't screw it up, and I think he was messing with me. I think that's why he put it over here. A lot of stuff going into my my head right now. Um, um, Thinking about God's will, and for me, um, like personally as as a dad, and um, as a husband and the middle school guy and a teacher and all that stuff, and what does he want me to to do and be and and yes, and then as a church, you know the connect thing and um, budgets that I don't understand any of, and um, I, what I do understand is big, 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 big trust of our elders, and um, I understand that, but they're seeking God's will and we're seeking it with them and. Um, just a lot going on in my head right now, and what that, what what God's will is. That's something I've I've thought about since uh, forever, you know. And um, and uh, that's all great and good and big and important. And I'm so glad that whatever, wherever we land, wherever we end up, that that His will is we remember Him. Um, we remember Him. Um, we remember uh, why we're here, and why we're going to Orangewood, and why we're adopting teachers. Um, Not for, uh, um, look at us, no, but for this, um, because people need to know about this. And uh, I'm so glad that's our heartbeat. That's my my heartbeat. That's what I I had to talk with Jason on Thursday. We're fully committed to giving our lives away, fully committed to it, and uh, because he did. And uh, I'm glad we get to remember this every week. Um, I look forward to it. It's awesome. Let's remember what God did for us as we get to just see what his will for us is. Um, God, thanks. Um, Forever our God reigns. Um, We need you. I need you. Not just every day, but every hour and every minute. Um, Point me in directions where you want me to love you and serve others. And um, thanks for open door fellowship, God, what it's men in my life uh, in the last seven years and uh, so many others. But God, thank you for what you mean in my life. Um, And you had me picked out before time began um, to love people and uh, to be among others, God. And you picked people in this room as well, all these people, to be among others. So um, let's give us this time to remember you and how awesome you are. Uh, We need you. We love you. Amen.
to you because we have been bought with this price too rich for any money in all the world it cost the blood of God's only son and now all ransoms have been paid everything has been taken care of at that cross that's why we put our faith in you and you alone Lord everything about our lives God we say you are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our trust. And that's why we give you this offering too, Lord. 
it is yours. All that we have is yours already, God. So we say here, you have what you have given us. Use it for your glory. Use it to make the name Jesus fall on every mouth, every tongue, every soul, every heart. Your will be done in this, Jesus. In your glorious name, we pray. Amen.
for what you have done, what the cross has done for us. And now we sing glory, praise, honor all to you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you guys for worshiping with us. If you want to talk to anybody or have any questions, please come on up. The elders will be up here. We'd love to talk with you or pray with you. If not, have a great week, you guys. We'll see you soon.